so we live in times where it's considered wise and enlightened. It's conventional wisdom to say it's so bad and talk about how bad it is. And it's so bad, it's never going to get better. There's no hope. That's just naive to believe that it could really turn around. And when we do that, and when we join the chorus of so many people that are saying that, spiritually, we are doing this. And we're got this spiritual blindfold on, and we're saying, for some reason, I can't see God anywhere. For some reason, it seems like God has vanished and he's gone away. It seems like it's even more hopeless. And what we don't realize is we've done this to ourselves. And so what it means for us to be followers of Christ in hopeless times is we've got to take the blindfold off and not let it mess up our mic. And find ways, Lord, we need to see you now more than ever. And how do we see God in hopeless, dark times? And so this morning, we're going to talk about three ways from Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2 is a dark chapter. There's some pretty horrible things that happen in this chapter of the Bible. And the book of Esther, as we talked about last week, is so ironic because it's the only book of the Bible where the name God is never mentioned. And so it kind of forces us to really look for God, to seek him, even though it's not perfectly clear where he is. And I think that's so needed for us today because we need to look for God in this dark world. How do we find him? And so we're going to see three different really powerful ways that we're going to see God, not just in Esther chapter 2, but we can see him in 2024 in the darkness all around us. So I invite you to turn with me to the book of Esther, chapter 2. The words are going to be on the screen behind me, but encourage you, if you've got a Bible you brought from home, it can really be helpful to pull that out or, you know, on your phone if you prefer that. Because what I always want is for us to be really seeing God from the pages of Scripture and learning to connect that with Him. So this is Esther chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Now I want to pull the timeline up. And so we get a sense of what's going on in history at this point. So, as we talked about last week, King Ahasuerus, that is the Hebrew name for the man that is much more commonly known by his Greek name, King Xerxes I. He came to power in 486 B.C. Now, the first three years of his reign, he suppressed revolts in 483 B.C. That's when the events of Esther chapter 1 take place. He held a massive banquet to raise up an army to attack the Greeks. And over the next three years, he raised up a massively powerful army. In fact, actually, he really went overkill. He raised up such a big army that he damaged the economy of Persia and made a lot of enemies to do this. But he wanted to make sure there was no way that he could lose because he was trying to prove that he was a better king than his father, King Darius. And so... Last week I shared the Persian reports that he raised up an army of one million soldiers. I read this week, some, there are some historians that really doubt that and say it was, you know, probably more like three to 500,000. But either way, it was a massively powerful army. And the best estimates we have of the Greek army at this time is it had 7,000 soldiers. So even if it's only 300,000 soldiers against 7,000 soldiers, it's such ridiculous overkill. There's no way he can lose. And even though the Greek navy was famously powerful, it only had 271 ships. So Xerxes built 1,200 ships so he could overpower the Greek navy as well. And they didn't stand a chance. And so in 480 BC, Xerxes launched one of the most famous invasions in history, and it was the most humiliating, embarrassing defeat of history. If you've ever heard of the famous story of the 300 Spartan soldiers that held off the entire Persian army, this is when that happened. That, shockingly, the Greeks actually won. And when they lost with the army, he came after them with the navy, and they crushed his navy as well. And so... Xerxes, for all his power that he brags about, for all the money he brags about, for all that he has to offer, he lost because he wasn't wise 
And he wasn't smart. His dad won battles with less troops than his opponent. And Xerxes was an utter and complete failure. And so he came back home in 479 BC, just completely humiliated, not just before the Greeks, but before his own people. And people started to grumble that he was a pathetic leader, and his own people started to turn against him. Well, the historian Herodotus, um, who was a contemporary at this time, so I actually know a lot about Xerxes in this period of history, he reports that Xerxes became obsessed with women at this time. And he actually had a series of affairs with his officer and noble's spouses, which really was not good and did a lot of damage to him politically. And so he was just sabotaging himself over and over again. For all the power and wealth he had, he really was a fool. And he couldn't save himself. Verse 2. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the capital, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of all the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. So notice who comes up with this idea. It wasn't Xerxes. It was the people around him. Xerxes really is incapable of making a decision. And so the people around him, like, this guy's making one bad decision after another. So let's just distract him and find a way to keep him busy so we can't keep doing damage to the empire. And so they get an idea, which really, if you think about it too much, is really gross. It was pretty common in um, ancient kings that they had very large harems. And they sought out, we're told here, young virgins. Now, this word is very important because it helps us understand Esther, um, who's going to be introduced shortly, and where she was at. This word in Persia refers to a girl that is between 9 and 15 years old. So in Persia, a girl was considered of marriageable age when she was nine years old. If a girl was 15 and still unmarried, it actually was a crime. And that was seen as a horrible thing, that either she was defective or she was just disobedient. And she actually could be put in jail for not being married by the time you were 15. So this helps us understand that when we talk about Esther later, Esther was a nine to 15 year old girl. Now, we've uncovered the palace, the citadel at Susa, and we've actually found the harem where all this took place and unearthed it. There were 22 rooms in an L-shaped pattern. In the center was a central place of honor, which was a large air garden that was lush, that was luxurious. But the 22 rooms were told by the historian Josephus that Xerxes had 400 girls in his harem. So you do the math, that's 18 girls per room. So they're packed in like sardines. This is not a luxurious life. This is not something that is good. And so Xerxes thinks this is a good idea. He sees a 9 to 15 year old girl and he thinks, this is someone I can use, I can take advantage of, that can benefit me. It's incredibly revealing about Xerxes' character that he thought in that way. Verse 5. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jehoiakim, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So verse 6 modifies Kish, um, his great-grandfather. And so that was 120 years earlier. So Mordecai and four generations of his family have been held captive. They were first taken captives by the Babylonians. When the Persians conquered Babylon, they were then taken captives by the Persians. And so if you do the math and count about 25 years per generation, this makes Mordecai about 40 years old at this time. Now, we never hear of a wife. It could have been married, but he may have been a widower. Given how many people died in this time, that would not be uncommon or unlikely. Verse 7, he was bringing up Hadassah, 
that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at when her father and her mother died. Mordecai took her as his own. So Hadassah is a Jewish name, but she's renamed Esther. Now, where does that name come from? It comes from Ishtar, the Babylonian star goddess. Now, that's shocking for a Jew. So in the exile, when the Jews were held captive for generations, there was one group of Jews that said, we're going to retain our national identity. We're going to be as Jewish as possible. And even though that's going to make our lives harder, even though that's going to mean suffering, because what matters most is our being loyal to God and loyal to Torah no matter what. But there was also a group of Jews that said, look, Israel's gone. The Holy Land's gone. The temple's gone. We just need to exist and survive. So we need to compromise and just get by as best we can. And so many of them took Persian or Babylonian names and stopped following Torah just so they could survive in such a hard time. So the fact that Hadassah was named after the Babylonian goddess of the stars That's very revealing, actually. It would have horrified most pious Jews that this is a family that compromised. This is a family that was giving in. This is a family that was just trying to survive amidst the hard time and didn't necessarily follow all of God's ways. And so Mordecai, we learn, is his cousin. So her dad was his uncle. So they're the same generation. So in the Persian Empire... Mordecai could have taken her as a wife. That actually would have been seen even as morally praiseworthy in the Persian Empire, especially if he was a widower. But even if he was married, it was common to have multiple wives in the Persian Empire. He could have said, look, I'm lonely. She's really beautiful. And this is really what's going to benefit me. And hey, I can benefit her at the same time. And so that would have been socially acceptable. That would have been seen as normal. And of course, that would have benefited Mordecai. But this is perhaps the most important thing we learn about Mordecai in the entire book of Esther. That he looks at Esther, this 9 to 15 year old girl, and he took her as his own daughter. That he looks at a 9 to 15 year old girl and says, she's precious. She needs to be protected. She needs to be loved. She needs to be nurtured. She needs to be supported. And as a 40-year-old man, he looked upon her as a dad. And that's how he saw her. That's really beautiful. And really says a lot about what kind of man Mordecai really was. Especially contrasted to Xerxes that was 39, his same exact age, and how Xerxes looked at 9 to 15-year-old girls. Verse 8. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in the custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put into the custody of Haggai who had charge of the women. Now I want to speak to those of you who are dads, especially those of you who are fathers of a daughter. Some of you... Your girls aren't quite that old yet. But can you picture them when they're 9 to 15? Some of you have daughters, and your daughters are much older than 9 to 15. But I'll bet you can, in a moment, remember your daughter when she was that age. I know I can. Some of you have girls that are that age. And dads, what goes through your heart? Like when your daughter was between 9 and 15, what happened inside you? I don't know about you, but I had some pretty strong protective instincts that started coming out in me of just like, you are not messing with my little girl. My little girl is precious. Because for a healthy dad, your daughter holds a soft spot in your heart. And she's precious to you. And so to think about this vicious king taking your precious little girl and kidnapping her and taking her into his harem is horrific. 
Like this is not, oh, Esther decided to join a beauty contest. How nice. This is so evil and horrific. It's hard to imagine something worse happening to a family. It's like we already went through losing. She lost her parents, you know, and we've had people we love that die. We're living in exile. And then you take my pride and delight and joy, my precious little girl, and that nasty, evil king takes her. Like, this is so awful. Like, how could anything good come from something so viciously evil? Now, a lot of Jews at the time would have said, well, that's what you get. You guys compromised. You lost God's blessing. You named your daughter after the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. I mean, what did you expect? You've lost God's blessing. God doesn't care about you because you compromised. Verse 9. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food. And with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place of the harem. Now, this is Haggai, the chief of the eunuchs, that he, Esther won his favor. Now, this word favor is really surprising because it's not the normal word you would expect for favor in the Hebrew. It's the word Hesed. Well, what's the word Hesed? It means loving kindness. It means loyal love. It's a word in Hebrew that's only used of God. And it really is a surprise seeing it show up in the harem of a nasty, self centered king that you see Hesed coming upon Esther. Huh. What do you look for? When you're looking for God in a dark time, you're looking for hesed. You're looking for loving kindness. You're looking for loyal love. And ironically and amazingly, Esther gets loving kindness. Being promoted to the best place in the harem means she's no longer stuffed in like sardines into these rooms with 18 girls. She's actually put in a place of honor in the center of the harem. This is an incredible blessing. And even have women to attend and support her. Like, this is shocking that she would get such favor. Verse 10. Oh. And with her cosmetics and her portion of food. Now, this is striking. This means she was given the unclean food of the Persians and unlike Daniel that said, no, I want to honor God no matter what. I'm only going to eat vegetables and water. And Esther ate the unclean food. She broke the dietary laws. She didn't follow Daniel's example, which would have been widely known and praised at this time. Verse 10, Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And she didn't tell anyone about her God. She didn't tell anyone even that she was Jewish. Now, what's so interesting is over the last 2,500 years since this is written, commentators have freaked out over this. See, there's one whole group of commentators that are just talking about how sinful and evil Esther was. When, how she compromised the Torah. That in Deuteronomy, you're not supposed to marry or have any relations with someone who's a Gentile that's not a Jewish, not Jewish. She should have followed the dietary laws. She shouldn't have identified herself with Ishtar. She should have let people know her proud heritage, that she was part of God's people, and she doesn't. And so a lot of commentaries see Esther and Mordecai as they're sinful, they're wrong, they're bad, they have sinned, and this is why they're in this position. And there's a whole nother set of commentators that talk about how really she didn't have a choice about the matter. Think about how young she was. Think about her situation. That really she was really good. And so what's so striking is the text in verse 11 could either choose to condemn Esther and Mordecai and talk about how bad they were or it could choose to praise Esther and Mordecai and talk about how moral they really were. Well, what does it say? Verse 11, and every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Doesn't condemn her. It doesn't praise her. It talks about how much 
Mordecai really loved his daughter and how much his daughter really loved him. That what you see is actually hesed. You see loyal love. You see loving kindness between a father and a daughter. And that that is really the picture of God in the midst of a dark time. That it's not she was so morally pure and good. It's that, boy, how they loved one another. Do you know that's really the picture for you and I? How will all men know that you're my disciples? Is it because we're just so morally pure and better than everyone else? Well, Jesus said, no, that you have love for one another. That it's love that really shows God to the world even more than our morals, as important as those are. It's goodness instead of evil. See, what we're called to is we're called to be deeply good in a world that is deeply evil. Now, we throw these terms out, good and evil, but oftentimes we don't really understand what they are. And this passage is actually a powerful picture of what good is all about and what evil is all about. So the Hebrew word evil is ra'ah, And it means a radical self-centeredness. So biblical evil is, I only care about myself. I only want what's good for me. I don't care about you one way or the other. And if something that's good for me is bad for you or injures or hurts you, too bad. Doesn't really matter. Because you don't matter. Only I matter. And what a picture of evil that Xerxes looks at a precious, nine to 15-year-old girl. Probably the best way for us to think about Esther is to imagine her as a 13-year-old girl that matured early. It's like so precious, so delicate. And then he looks at that little girl and says, good, I can use her for my benefit and then throw her away when I'm done. That is the face of evil. And so Xerxes is an evil man at his core. But what is good? Hebrew word tov. It's deeply connected with hesed. It's deeply connected with love. You see, love is you are more important than me. Love is I care about you. I will sacrifice what's good for me for your benefit and for your care. It's the opposite of evil. In humility, consider others more important than yourself. Jesus is the ultimate picture. Greater love knows no one than this, that you lay down your life for your friends. And so the picture of Mordecai, the picture of Mordecai is his self-sacrificial love. That he looks at Esther, this 9 to 15 year old girl, how can I care for her? How can I protect her? How can I build her up? How can I support her? And so, you know the world we live in. The world we live in is profoundly self-centered. It's all about me. And I don't really care about you. That is the face of evil in 2024. And so how do we find God? We're good. We're loving. We're kind especially in how we treat the most vulnerable people in our midst, that we're gentle with people that are delicate and broken, that we care for people that are vulnerable, that we protect the weak and the needy. And in that way, we see the goodness of God, and that way we can be the goodness of God. And so that's the first way that we see God in the midst of an evil age. Verse 12, now when the turn came for each young woman to go in to King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil and myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women. So what the Persians did is they would fumigate. They would burn spices and they would kind of in a tent and those fumes of the spices would actually infuse their skin so their skin started to smell like the spices. And then they would do months of oil treatments to make their skin really, really soft. And this is, was to make them more beautiful and more desirable. Verse 13, when the young woman went into the king this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. So 
Women could, the girls, they're not really women, they're too young for that, they could get whatever jewelry or clothes they wanted to bring in. And most of the girls said, great, you know, if I can have more jewels and clothes, I want to get as much as I can and take that in. And often they would get to keep that, and that would be considered there in a twisted way, wedding gift. In the evening, verse 14, she would go in. And in the morning, she would return to the second harem in the custody of Shagaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. And so, there are 400 girls. Vast majority of these girls are never going to see the king again. And so they're going to live in a room with 18 other girls packed in. They can't go back to their families They can't marry a man that's actually going to love them. They can't have children. They're perpetual widows. They're kept as possessions. This is evil. This is so horrible to do this to all of these girls that can't defend themselves and can't speak up for themselves. Verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abahel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king. Now, did you notice in that first part of verse 15, what do you learn twice about Esther? How is she described as a? She's a daughter. See, Xerxes and the world looks at her as an object. God sees her as a daughter. She's precious, she's loved, she's valuable. No matter what Xerxes says, no matter what the world thinks, she's a daughter. She asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. So she asked for advice. She was humble. She wasn't just trying to get as much as she could. She sought wisdom. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And here again, we see hesed, we see favor, we see grace, we see loving kindness poured on Esther in the darkest of all places, in the worst of all times. You see a picture of God's light in the midst of the darkness focused on this one precious girl. Verse 16, and when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. So the month of Tebeth is, is December 479 BC, January 478 BC. This is six months after his defeat to the Greeks. The winter palace was the palace at Susa. So this fits everything that we know about Xerxes and this timeline and when she would have come in. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, what are the odds? Like something so evil and so horrible, and I think the more we you probably don't want to think about it too deeply. The more you think about the reality of what was going on in that contest and how vicious it was and how carnal it was, to see something that horrible lead to Esther, of all people, being promoted to be queen? So in the Babylonian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar just ravaged Israel, destroyed the temple, destroyed God's people. He was evil. God raised up Daniel to stand beside him, to temper him, to speak wisdom, to share about God, and to influence this evil king for good, for the protection of his people and the protection of God's people. The same Daniel was lifted up to be Darius's advisor, Xerxes' father's, and cared for him and gave him advice and wisdom. And Now, Xerxes isn't going to listen to a Jewish advisor at this point, but maybe this evil man might just listen to a young, beautiful woman. And so God raises up Esther to be a queen, to take the same role in the same place that God used Daniel under very different circumstances, to speak truth, to speak grace. What are the odds that this would happen? In an empire of 100 million people, that's amazing. And so, 
This is a dramatic reversal that you would never expect to happen. This is God taking something so horrible and bringing good out of something that was really evil. Verse 18, then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. Remember the feast in chapter one? Whose feast was that? That was Xerxes' feast. That was all about him, about his power, his wealth, his entertainment. And he throws another feast, but it's not about him. It's about Esther. Well, don't expect that. Is she rubbing off on him? Is she having an influence that he's actually thinking about someone other than himself? He also granted remission of taxes to the provinces. Now, this meant... He took the poor around this massive empire and gave them a tax break where you guys don't have to pay taxes for a year. Well, that doesn't benefit the powerful that can help him back. That benefits the needy and the poor, the people that can't help Xerxes. That's just an act that's just kind. From Xerxes? Probably one of the most self-centered beings who's ever lived and walked the face of this planet is doing something kind for people that can't do something back for him, is throwing a feast to bless and honor Esther and not himself. And then he gave gifts with royal generosity. Now, Herodias, the historian, records that something shocking happened to King Xerxes in about 478 BC that he changed from oppressing his people with his military. He changed from his attacks on his neighbors, and he started doing construction projects and investing in the Persian Empire and helping out his own people. It's something that Herodotus couldn't explain, the change in this really nasty, evil king. And you read this, you wonder, was it Esther? Did she have an impact on him? Now, not like he's all of a sudden a good guy, but he's got someone profoundly good that's whispering in his ear and having an influence on his heart. Isn't that shocking? You know, what I love about this passage is I love how it doesn't sugarcoat just how sick and how evil this whole thing was. It really was. But then to see that God takes a time that's so dark and so evil and so carnal and brings something beautiful out of the midst of something so terrible that you'd never expect. And brothers and sisters, this is the pattern of the entire Bible. I mean, just look at the death of Christ and how wrong that was, how unjust that was, that someone so perfect and good, God comes to this world to love and bless us, and we kill him. And what did God do? God raised him from the dead and brought salvation and new life for all of us. And so when you and I, we look at the horrible things, and there's a lot of horrible things in our world today to look at, and just see how evil it is. You and I believe in a God that can bring beauty out of ashes, that can bring light out of dark, that specializes, that when it is the darkest, that's when God loves to move the most powerfully. And so when everyone else is caught in despair and hopelessness about how, just how bad it is, you and I, if we really have a biblical worldview, we look at the darkness and we go, ooh, Something really good is about to happen because our God is so good and our God can turn this around and our God brings light in the darkness. And so when's the light going to come? And we start praying and praising the light into the dawn. And so we look for the darkness. We're not afraid of it because our God is stronger than the darkness. Verse 19. Now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. So I show a picture of the palace at Susa. 
So, okay, the very front, you see a, an arrow that says King's Gate. So the King's Gate was not just a gate, it actually was a building. So there's two gates, there's a central courtyard um, with four pillars, and then there's two rooms on either side. What it meant when it said someone was sitting at the King's Gate, it meant that they were a palace official. And so this means that Mordecai, after Esther was promoted to be queen, he became a palace official that interacted with the public. So the public would come into the front of the gate and the palace officials that were sitting at the king's gate would do business with people coming in. So according to Persian records, there was an accountant named Marduka that was later promoted to a high place in Xerxes' official administration. Now, just like Esther went, or sorry, Hadassah went by Esther, just like Daniel went up by Belteshazzar, many people, when they, especially when they served in official court, uh, they picked a name that was more common for that people. So a lot of historians believe that this Marduka um, from Xerxes' administration is the same Mordecai that became an accountant at the king's gate. And so he's serving in this position, working for Xerxes and able to interact with his daughter because of this position. Verse 20, Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. That here there's this beautiful father-daughter bond between the two of them where they trust each other and they listen to each other and they still connect with each other no matter what. And indeed, really there was no one that Esther could trust as much as Mordecai, her dad. Verse 21, in those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigtham and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So seeking to lay hands is a plot to assassinate the king. Now this shouldn't surprise us because in 465 BC, 13 years later, Xerxes actually was assassinated by a eunuch and a bodyguard, and he's killed in the same way. And the reason that there were attempts on his life, multiple attempts, is because he was so hated for his cruelty. He was hated for his extravagant spending. He was hated because he failed in the war with Greece. He was hated because he just was a bad politician. And so there were multiple attempts on his life. And what's striking as we read this is we read the names of these two people that actually were trying to have him assassinated. This really shows us from a historical perspective, this must have been written by someone that was there at the time and knew because this wouldn't have been written down in the Persian records. So Mordecai just so happens to find out about this. Verse, 20, verse 22, and this came to the knowledge of Mordecai. Like, what are the odds? You just think about it. Like, there's two people that are plotting a secret assassination of the king, and Mordecai just happens to, thanks to this unlikely circumstance with Esther, happens to then all of a sudden be promoted to have an official position, and he so happens to be at the right place at the right time to hear about this assassination plot against the king. Like, what are the odds that that would happen? Like, this is so unlikely. But the problem that a low official would have, like Mordecai, is how do I get this information to the king? Because there's probably other people that are involved that are in on the plot. So I can't go directly to Xerxes. He couldn't go directly to the king unless the king invited him or extended his golden scepter, which the king wouldn't do to Mordecai. So as he tells his direct boss, then that he might be in on the plot and he might be killed. So how would it be possible for a low official that comes to this information to be able to get the information to the king? And he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And because of this shockingly unlikely connection between Esther and Mordecai, she's able to get the information to King Xerxes through Esther. And Esther tells him, this came from Mordecai. Like, what are the odds of this happening? This is so unlikely, such a shocking coincidence. You kind of wonder how something like that happens. Verse 23, and when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, it was true. 
And something even more unlikely happened. So Xerxes always wanted to publicly reward loyalty, especially because he had so many officials like this that weren't loyal to him. So he was known for every time there was an opportunity for him to reward or honor someone, he did so. And this is the one time that Xerxes forgot to do that. And he knew full well that Mordecai had saved his life, and he just wrote it down in a book and left it at that. That's really unlikely. That seems kind of unfair after all Mordecai did. I wonder if that's going to be a coincidence that's going to be important later on as we walk through this book and see God's work. You know, when I was a brand new Christian coming out of atheism, I'd start saying, what a coincidence. Because there are all these crazy coincidences that just started happening in my life. We're just like, does this just really a coincidence? Was it just luck that made this happen? Or was it God? So here in the book of Esther, we do not see the name of God mentioned anywhere, but we see loving kindness show up in places that we don't expect. We see dramatic reversals that you never would think, and we see coincidences that don't really make logical sense outside of God's divine direct intervention. And so at the same time that God is seemingly invisible, if you know where to look, God is everywhere through the book of Esther. God is in the goodness, the kindness, the hesed that you see throughout this book. God is in the dramatic reversals. God is in the coincidences. And you got to wonder, maybe that's where God is in 2024. God is in the loving kindness and the goodness that you see in a dark world. God reveals himself, maybe not so much in how morally superior we are to everyone else, but maybe when we're kind and loving and gentle and gracious, especially to people that are vulnerable or would never expect it. That we're the people that trust in God's dramatic reversals and so we're hopeful when everyone else is hopeless. That we're looking for those coincidences. We're looking for those times when God steps in that you never expect it. And we start looking for those things. We might just see God everywhere. Let's pray. God, we ask forgiveness for our blindfolds. For our blindfolds of doubt. Our blindfolds of despair. Our blindfolds of being so focused on evil and so focused on sin and so focused on everything that is wrong in this world and so focused on man that we miss you. Holy Spirit, would you help us to see the good, the kindness, the hesed? Would you help us to be agents of good? Would you help us to be loving and caring for the weak, for the helpless, for the needy, for people that are overlooked by this world? Would you help us to trust you that you are God that does dramatic reversals? And would you help us to see the coincidences that aren't coincidences and see your hand when it seems invisible? We love you. We want to see you more and more. Amen.